Tom, lovely to see you. You too. Now, Charles Bronson, mm. described as a monster, yeah. Britain's most dangerous inmate, yeah. the UK's answer to Hannibal Lecter. No. Some pretty ugly boots to fill. Were you nervous or worried at all about taking on such a hated man? No, mm, no. not really. Not, no. I was just fascinated and interested. Um, and nervous of other things, but not about playing him. No, not at all. Uh, or the ramifications thereof, uh, no. Uh, it was quite exciting in, in some ways, and uh, and at the same time, um, I mean, you remember, for an actor, there's two sides to this, isn't there? There's, there's my vanity and my ego that says, oh, if I bulk up and put some weight on and do a film where I'm kicking people and stuff, people are going to take notice of my career. And the other half, I'm fascinated in, in investigating people uh, who are real, you know? So uh, it, it was a challenge, but that, uh, and daunting in this fact that I thought I might fail. And you know, um, but then there's if you, the concept of failing and winning anything is redundant. So the journey is all that counts, and it was in incredibly interesting. And you took a really personal approach to your research. You met with his family, and you met mm. him. Mm. Obviously, there's we all know his history, but how different is the I mean, the man and the myth? What did you make of him? Because you kind of made friends with him. Mm. Yeah. Well, um, there's for me. I mean, there's like the history of Charlie Bronson, his story, and the books, etc. And then when I met him. Uh, very separate things, you know, like that's the archive of events and, and research purposes and the time that I met him was my one-on-one -on -one time and my experience of Charlie and Charlie didn't obviously want to haze me in any way to, so that I was incapable of telling his story and there was certain parts of him that probably wanted me to, to make him look like Superman and certain parts of him, you know, didn't want any mention of anything probably very nasty that he'd done at all but, um, but then after further, you know, conversations and, and talks you know, he was very forthcoming about all kinds of information uh, and, and unscrupulously honest, uh, fearlessly honest about his, uh, you know, behaviour, and uh, and all kinds of things. So my well, relationship was was one very much a, of, a, of a young man with an older man, uh, and he constantly pulled the rug from under my feet and surprised me with his generosity and tact and humour and uh, humility and uh, his. Um, his warmth, actually. Never, one, obviously it's very difficult to put away the fact that he's in prison in, in maximum security for the crimes that he's committed. And, you know, it's very hard to get a gauge on what has actually really happened, what has he, he has really done. Uh, and that which we see in the, the tabloid papers, it doesn't really tally up uh, the monster. I'm not sure about that at all. Um, there's all kinds of um, criminals in the penal system who have done much more heinous um, criminal acts, um, paedophilia, you know, rapists, murderers. One doesn't bracket it, even, you know, you know, Saddam Hussein is considered a monster and then Charlie Bronson in the same headline doesn't really add up, I think, it's, it's a swooping generalisation, so... Um, I mean, is he still calling you now? I mean, are you going to get a Christmas card? No, he doesn't, actually. Like I get a Christmas card, you know, I get a letter and stuff like that, but no, it doesn't bother me at all, in, in many ways. You know, uh, in fact, quite the opposite. He's got things to do, he's busy <laughs> in business. Um, I'm not that important. I was expecting to see you half the size of what you are in this film, but you're, I hear you're bulking up for something else. Has mm. it been an added bonus, gaining all these muscles with your other half loving it? Mm, no. It's funny that, because um, in my experience anyway, um, they are, um, girl, a girl will often prefer me to me not as muscly. <laughs> yeah, funny that. Do you know what I mean? Um, until you know you need to to get someone out of the way <laughs> for, the, for the greater good <laughs> or for the safety of you and your children, but no, on the whole, not really. I go up and down all kinds of shapes, you know. And I mean, this is coming out kind of at the same time that he's having uh, another parole hearing. Do you think mm. he will be released, or should, do you think he should be released? No, he can't be released initially because, uh, at this parole hearing anyway, because he has to be decategorised from car, um, a category A. A prison, uh, and at the moment he's a, a maximum secure prisoner, so he'd have to go be de decategorised slowly, slowly, and it would be a long, lengthy process before eventually he was, you know, open prisoned and then halfway housed and, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, <clears throat> considering if you think about who his neighbours are, and uh, in versus my own personal opinion, and uh, uh, and what the crimes that they've done, and all multiple murderers, uh, some child murderers, and one cannibal, technically in inverted commas, uh, and then Charlie hasn't killed anyone, but it's caused a great amount of damage and hasn't left people as he's found them at times. But uh, in the last nine years, has caused no 
physical damage or harm to anybody, and was supposed to be up for parole um, after three or four years of his sentence, has now served nine of those years, and still hasn't had a parole hearing to be decategorised. I think it's time he was decategorised and moved along the system, but uh, at the moment he's stuck still in, a, uh, in uh, maximum security in Wakefield. So uh, I don't think he'll get out, no, uh, not this week, uh, next, uh, uh, but I think it would be a shame if he wasn't at least um, you know, uh, bust down to a different category or, or, or looked you know, positively towards in, in that direction. That's my personal opinion. Uh, I can't speak obviously for his victims, uh, but my opinion and the man that I've met and, and subsequently come to know, um, I believe should be on that journey to rehabilitation when I've met a lot of people who who are on the streets and shouldn't be. Very quickly on you, you're officially a leading man now. I believe mm. you're the same agent as Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt and Meryl Streep. That must <laughs> afford you lots of nice perks, I'm thinking. I'm, I'm not that I've noticed. I, I'm actually, I'm, on, um, I, I'm spending most of my time in a dojo with sweaty men, uh, carrying them about and sort of being punched. Uh, so no, no perks there uh, yet. Uh, you're missing out on something. You should be like, come on, Brad, hey, Meryl. I don't know if that's really my calling just yet. And I think I've got to eat a lot more <laughs> the, before that happens. But, um, the, yeah, no, I've, I've signed with one of those uber, hyper, you know, uh, agencies, the turbocharged agencies in the States, which is great. And they, they're working really hard and they've, they've, they've you know, got me a lot of a lot of stuff. You know, they've gone out there and, uh, and got me work. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, how that moves. So now I'm involved in a big cage fighting film, so I have to train to be a, a UFC fighter. And uh, by July, I have to be 15 stone and dangerous. That sounds just scary. Yeah, yeah, for you. Yeah, I'm living <laughs> it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's I wish you could carry on, but I have to stop there. Thank you very yeah. much indeed. Cheers. Nice work.